Up the morning to you. Goldman Sachs is trading up today after announcing second quarter results that beat on both revenue and earnings per share. Goldman Sachs operates across four business segments, investment banking, global markets, which include market making as well as market lending, asset management, and then consumer banking and wealth management. You can see that investment banking revenue is down 41% versus the same time last year. Global markets are up 32%, driven primarily by fixed income trading. Asset management is down 79%. That's kind of astonishing. And then consumer banking and wealth management is up 25%. Overall, net revenues are down 23%, but operating expenses are only down 11%. So that earnings are overall down significantly more than revenue at minus 48% versus last year. Breaking down the investment banking revenue in more detail, we can see that financial advisory revenue is down only 5%. That reflects that Goldman Sachs actually has a big backlog, a big book of potential customers who are just waiting for conditions to improve. So during 2021, there were many companies that didn't quite get to actually issuing all the securities that they wanted to. Um, now in 2022, we saw this with JP Morgan, with Morgan Stanley, and now we're also seeing it with... Um, Goldman Sachs is they have a big backlog of customers who want to issue new securities, whether that's new debt issuances or uh, new secured or new uh, equity ins issuances, stock issuances. Um, but they're waiting for the market to rebound to some degree. So for now, they're still being advised, though. So we can see that that financial advisory service revenue is only down five percent. However. If conditions in the markets do not improve or if they, condition, if they continue to deteriorate, then I would expect that financial advisory revenue to start drying up more and for us to see a bigger drop there. Um, we can see that the primarily, you know, the biggest drop is in equity underwriting, which is down 89%, right? That's an astonishing level, 89%. We're at only 11% of the level that we were at last year at the same time. And that reflects that, you know, during last year, we had a crazy amount of IPOs, direct listings, um, companies like AMC, which just you know issued more stock, um, we had a bunch, a bunch of market activity, and that has essentially all dried up now. Uh, we also see that debt underwriting is down 52%. Uh, overall, underwriting is down 73%. However, corporate lending is up 121%. That's also similar to what we saw with Morgan Stanley, which is as a lot of these big corporate customers um, are not able to issue new bonds because the market is just has no appetite for them, they're instead going to commercial banks and, and lenders like Goldman Sachs to get financing. If we look at this chart, we get a nice visual representation of the investment banking visits of Goldman Sachs. We can see that financial advisory is a solid business base, right? It remains pretty steady regardless of the market conditions so far. Um, however, you know, if that starts to deteriorate, that will be a big warning sign for the investment banking business. That said, Goldman Sachs, although it's thought of as an investment bank, you know, we've seen the numbers. They're not actually an investment bank. They have an investment banking division, but that's actually, you know, a small, maybe 20 percent of their total business. Asset management is a pretty large percentage. And as of um, this quarter, second quarter 2022, uh, we actually had the consumer banking and wealth management business grow larger for the first time than the investment banking business. Um, that's strategically important as Goldman Sachs is actively trying to push into more consumer banking. That is their main sort of strategic um, objective. Goldman Sachs global markets business was actually up 32% this quarter. Goldman Sachs asset management business has net revenues down 79%. However, that's not quite as bad as it seems. If you take a look at this chart, you can see that the equity investments are actually down 221 uh, million. And that's actually a non-cash expense that reflects mark-to-market -market accounting, basically a portfolio of public and private securities um, have been written down. Now, the equity investments that have been written down are primarily public securities. Uh, the private equity investments that uh, Goldman Sachs has have not been written down quite as much. Um, one of the analysts actually asked about this during the earnings call, and they asked, hey, why haven't the private equity securities been written down as much? You know, is that, that seems a little suspicious. Um, have they actually fallen farther in value than you're, and, and you're just not telling us? Um, you know, if you go back, companies often, um, this is something they struggle with, right? So it, one of the reasons that Enron you know, was able to hold their scandal um, from the public for so long was because they had this, you know, this set of hard to value securities um, that, that nobody was really sure what they were worth. They weren't necessarily publicly traded. Um, it was actually all this like subsidiary corporation that owned a bunch of stuff. 
Um, so it, it's not a new problem. Um, I'm not saying Goldman Sachs is Enron by any means. I'm just saying the problem of valuing non-publicly traded securities is an old problem. Um, now, when an analyst asked that question during the earnings call, the uh, Goldman Sachs executives said that um, they believed that the public securities had fallen further and that they gave two reasons. One was they said that um, the private securities were just better companies, which seems a little bit suspicious. Like, okay, are you really that you know much better at picking private companies than public companies? Um, the second reason was that they said, hey, if we try to look at comparables, um, the public companies are losing revenue uh, there or they're decreasing in margin. They're actually you know performing less well, and that's part of why they decline in price. On the other hand, if you look at our private companies, they're actually growing at a pretty rapid rate. That to me is a much more convincing reason as to why the um, or why the private securities shouldn't have been written down as much. But still, I do find it a little bit suspicious, so I would keep an eye on this going forward. Here you can actually see the asset management mix. So these are the different assets that uh, Goldman Sachs has under management. Um, you can see that about 13 billion of the total equity investments are private and only 3 billion are public. So this again, you know, is a reiteration of why it's important to you know, think about that private sector because they've they have this big loss, right? This two hundred some million dollar loss, uh, mark to market loss, right? Not a cash loss um, from their public securities, but they have a private security portfolio that is you know more than four times larger. So definitely, definitely worth keeping an eye on. Um, we know from some venture capital uh, funding rounds and some companies in the tech space that have raised money recently that you know if you're in tech or or a finance and you're a startup. Um, your valuations have fallen pretty substantially, at, at least in line with what we're seeing in public markets. So uh, we, we haven't seen that too much outside of the, the tech and um, finance sectors, uh, but it, it's definitely worth keeping an eye on. And we can see sort of a breakdown here of um, by industry, where, where are you know, Goldman Sachs' investments? So we have um, financial institutions here is only 11%, okay? Uh, and then, yeah, so it breaks down to consumers, has healthcare. This is a big chunk of real estate. Um, real estate. This is another another risk here, right? Real estate. So far, the market has not really pulled back. However, as uh, as rates continue to rise, prices, you know, might fall. You know, I would say if we enter a sort of stagflationary period, the prices might not fall so much because they'll just be constantly boosted by inflation. Um, but if the Fed is successful in raising rates enough and actually causing some you know, amount of economic pullback, then the prices of real estate probably will fall to a degree, in which case uh, this, you know, this 25%, uh, you know, so something basically the same size as the public market uh, could occur. So they probably won't fall as much, right? Like public securities um, can pull back. You know, we've had more than 50% of companies in the NASDAQ pull back more than 50%. Um, we've had big market indices pull back more than 20%. So equities, public equities have fallen quite a bit. I'm not sure that real estate will fall necessarily quite as much. Um, they could, but they probably won't fall quite that much. But, you know, let's say that half of that occurs, right? Let's say that we have a 10, you know, 10, 12% pullback in real estate. Uh, that could cause a hundred million plus dollar loss for uh, Goldman Sachs. So if we're coming up to the next, um, you know, quarter three earnings for Goldman Sachs, you know, I wouldn't be, I would, I would keep an eye on the housing market, right? If, if the housing market is down 10%, assume you're going to have a $100 million loss, uh, at least for Goldman Sachs. And that's just for uh, the real estate itself. It doesn't actually account for their um, mortgage investments uh, and their mortgage securities business uh, trading, right? The clearing corporation, uh, both of which may be affected. So things to keep an eye on. Um Let's see, we also have consolidated investment entities. Uh, here we have lending and debt investments. So uh, secured debt is the vast majority here, 84%, unsecured eight, uh, 16%. Um, real estate is a big percentage of this. So again, um, you know, if we enter enough of a recession that you know, real estate payments start becoming a problem, then that could also be a problem for Goldman Sachs. Finally, here we have the consumer banking and wealth management business, which is uh, Goldman Sachs' new darling, right? This is the business segment that they are actively trying to grow the most. Um, they're investing in it. They are trying to build out a digital platform that attracts a bunch of consumers. Um, we can see that the management and other fees are up 10% versus last year, incentive fees up 60%, private banking and lending up 23%. 
Um, this is all telling because, you know, we saw that the asset management business had uh, pulled back to a degree, right? Um, so the fact that we have something like incentive fees, you know, still growing very rapidly here, private banking and lending growing rapidly, uh, consumer banking up 67%, right? It's not that the sector is growing that fast. This is specific to um, Goldman Sachs. So I wouldn't extrapolate macro trends from this because this is a small business, right? It's kind of like a startup. Uh, because it's so small, it can grow very rapidly. Um, it can grow more rapidly than the economy can contract. So that's worth keeping an eye on. They did, however, have to build their provisions for credit losses. Now, this is partly due to regulatory uh, environment. Basically, as you're building a consumer depository institution, which is just a fancy way of saying a bank, um, you have to build up credit loss reserves. And those are front loaded frequently so that as uh, Goldman Sachs is ramping up their business, they have to be putting a lot of money into these reserves that appear as losses. However, they won't necessarily materialize as losses. So that's, a, that's important to, to recognize. However, if we do enter a, some sort of um, you know, actual substantial recession, then these might, these might materialize as, as credit losses. So that's sort of the dichotomy. If we don't go into a strong recession, these likely won't all materialize as credit losses. Uh, if we enter a pretty strong recession, um, then this, you know, it probably wouldn't get worse than this, uh, at least for the amount of deposits they have right now, right? Of course, if they have, if, as they continue to grow deposits, um, they may, you know, allocate future provisions for credit losses, which are not sufficient. But at their current ratio of deposits to provisions for credit losses, I would say that's that's pretty good. I, I would doubt that they would lose more than they, they've currently allocated, even in a moderate to strong recession. Uh, the operating expenses are only up uh, are up 26%, which is about the same as revenue. Um, overall, pre-tax earnings down 80%. Again, this is basically driven by this provision for credit losses, which are not yet materialized as real losses and may not be. So it's important to, to consider. Here we have a quick overview of the asset management and consumer banking and wealth management all combined. Now, uh, Goldman Sachs uses a metric called assets under supervision or AUS, which is sort of a strange metric. Um, if you look at a company like BlackRock or Blackstone, um, they're going to use uh, AUM, which is assets under management. Same if you look at a, basically any hedge fund or investment fund. Um, assets under management is basically, you know, you have some client assets, you're in charge of managing them or investing them. Uh, what is the total amount of those assets? So, for example, BlackRock, you know, at its peak last year, hit just over $10 trillion in assets under management. Um, and now they're down to something about eight, I think. Uh, so assets under supervision is a little bit more liberal of a metric, right? It's sort of it, it's um, it's worded as if it's somewhat comparable assets under supervision. But it's basically um, a combination of assets under management as well as other assets which are uh, custodied or uh, somehow held by Goldman Sachs, but over which Goldman doesn't necessarily have discretion. So that could include banking deposits. Um, it could include deposits in, uh, in terms of margin on their uh, clearinghouse corporation for fixed income securities. Um, so it's a little bit more liberal than the AUM. You know, I would say uh, a dollar of AUM in general is more valuable than a dollar of AUS for Goldman Sachs. So keep that basically in mind. So the total amount of AUS for Goldman Sachs is about 2.5 trillion, um, which is, you know, it's great. Um, it's about, a, you know, like I said, it's maybe a third or a quarter of the AUM uh, for BlackRock. But, you know, a dollar of AUS is, you know, I, I have not run the numbers, but let's say it's half as valuable as, a, as an AUM dollar. So, you know, maybe it's not a third to a fourth. Maybe it's more like a sixth to an eighth of the amount that uh, BlackRock has under their management. Here you can see a very interesting fact about Goldman Sachs's business, which is why they care so much about consumer banking, right? As they've been growing their consumer banking business, we see that, you know, from a year ago, we had 645 uh, million in net interest income. Now we're at 974 million. So we've, you know, uh, not quite, you know, something like 50% more, not quite 50% more uh, growth in that time as they've been growing that business. And at, it now dwarfs uh, all of the other sources, right? Even at peak um, last year, you know, we were generating 742 million in global markets, uh, net interest income. So that's from things like margin debt, et cetera. Um, but now, you know, not only has that global market uh, interest income shrunk, um, but the consumer banking uh, net interest income has increased 
even more than you know what it was at its peak last year which was a crazy year so this interest income right this is basically the future of what goldman sachs wants to be they are focused you know they're not they're not really reinvesting that much into growing their investment banking business really they're investing into their consumer banking business um, they they want to become a bigger consumer name. They want to go into the consumer wealth management, consumer banking industries. Um, that's where they see the money, and the majority of their income is basically like this is what they want their future to be. They want to have this you know light uh, turquoise box be very very large in the future. If we take a look at Goldman Sachs's expenses, we can see that compensation and benefits is down thirty percent versus last year. So that's good. They're being a bit nimble there. Um, market development is up 104%, uh, communications and technology up 20%, professional fees up 42%. Now they did talk in the earnings call about wanting to uh, decrease the professional fees, so that's good. However, it's a bit, um, you know, it's, it's not great to see that they're up so much uh, as is versus last year. You know, last year was such a crazy amount of activity that really to see to see any non-inflation related expenses uh, increase from last year to this year is a little bit of just, ah, oh, you know, it's, I, I don't like it because, you know, last year we had crazy record amounts of fiscal stimulus, right? Things like investment banking were basically at like twice, you know, the, this historical level. Um, you know, there just was a crazy amount of financial activity. So if you see a finance company that is like, hey, you know, we're increasing our costs more this year in any category, that's just... There, there can be good reasons for it, right? But it's just, you know, very, I have a lot of hesitancy around it. Like, you got to convince me why you need to be spending more this year, which is a soft year in finance and markets, versus last year. Here we have a summary of their capital and balance sheet. So in the upper uh, left side here, these are basically all of the different regulatory uh, capital requirements that uh, many banks are going to be reporting. Um, so you can compare these across different financial companies. Uh, if we look at the selected balance sheet data, we see that uh, total assets is at uh, 1.6 trillion, so higher than uh, Q2 2021. Um, deposits at 391 billion. Uh, unsecured long-term borrowings at 251 billion. Uh, shareholder equity 118. Book value, uh, book value for common share. This is what you want to look at if you're a normal stock investor. Um, this is at 301.88. And if we go back to look at the stock price currently, 302. So we're very close, right? We're essentially trading at book value here, which is, you know, it's a solid place to be. It doesn't uh, make you feel like you're overpaying for something. And that is it, guys. That is it for the second quarter uh, 2022 Goldman Sachs results. Um, if you want to see me cover a particular company, um, whether that's on a deep dive or just talking about their earnings, leave a comment below. Let me know what company that is. It can be any company, any sector. Um, let me know. And if you see something in the comments you like, upvote it, and I will choose from there to uh, include in future videos. See you next time.